Okay, so hopefully this is recording. I'm not quite sure what the, this accessory is not supported by the iPad means, but what I want to do today is I want to start talking about number theory, and I want to talk about some of the tools we need to assault number theory. Complex analysis, a lot of the results were inspired by people trying to understand the properties of the prime numbers. There's a joke that the you know, shortest distance between you know, two primes or between two numbers is through the complex plane. And at first, it seems absolutely absurd that if we want to study the primes, which are integers, you know, things we can count on our fingers, we want to take a detour into the complex plane. Why would we want to take detours into the complex plane? Why would we go into the complex plane to study primes? There's got to be some benefit to doing this. Other than I like talking about primes and I'm supposed to be teaching you complex analysis, so I've got to somehow link them. What can we use if we go into the complex plane? What, what kind? What can we do really well in complex analysis? Path integrals. It's much easier to integrate in the complex plane than in the real line. And what we do is we have this beautiful residue theorem. So the idea is that maybe we can associate a nice function to the primes and from that nice function, use results from complex analysis to understand it. So you want to have some idea of why this is true. The big result we're leading up to is the prime number theorem. And it basically says, if you let pi of x be the number of primes, p, p prime, p less than equal to x, then pi of x is approximately x over log x as x goes to infinity. A little bit better is that pi of x is about li of x, the logarithmic integral, the integral from 2 to x of dt over log t. The famous Riemann hypothesis, so if you were to play family feud with you know, top open problems in mathematics, Guess Riemann hypothesis as number one. Okay. One of the best, if not best, open problems in mathematics. So much relies on this. Essentially, it means pi of x minus li of x is bounded by x to the one half plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero. You can do a little bit better than the plus epsilon. You can replace it, I believe, with a log squared of x. But you know, I really don't want to worry about being too accurate right now in the broad overview. It's about square root cancellation. So think philosophy of square root cancellation. OK, so the question is, how do we get our hand on something like this. What we're going to do is we're going to create a function which is related to the primes and is easy to understand. And we're going to use a magical beast called analytic continuation. How many of you have seen analytic continuation before? Okay, if you haven't, please raise your hand because you've seen it, you just haven't heard it called that. You've all seen analytic continuation before. You take a function which you know in some region and you extend it to another region. So what's the classic example of a function we extend? It's the only sum we really know how to do, the only infinite sum we really understand. Geometric series. So the geometric series, 1 plus r plus r squared, plus r cubed equals 1 over 1 minus r. And when we write this, what are we supposed to put on as a constraint? Absolute value of r less than 1. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, what does this equal? If it makes you feel better, I'll put equal in quotes. Now what is it equal? Infinity. I'm sorry? No, please, not infinity. Negative 
Ne not negative 112, but I do like where you're going. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. Come on, what should this be? Negative 1. 1 over 1 minus 2, or negative 1. Right? So basically, all the stuff that you've been yelled at by your teachers for years about not doing, it's okay to do now. Does this mean that the sum of all the powers of 2 is so large, it, by, it goes beyond positive infinity, comes from negative infinity, and almost makes it back up to 0 before it runs out of steam? No. What it means, though, is that this function, which makes sense when the absolute value of r is less than 1, agrees with this function when the absolute value of r is less than 1. But this function is defined in more places. And so the two functions agree where they're both defined, but this is defined for more values of r. So we consider this the extension of this function. Another way of looking at it, perhaps a better way of looking at it, is this is the fundamental function we're looking at, 1 over 1 minus r. If r is less than 1, it has this Taylor series expansion about 0. If we're at another point, if r is larger, we no longer have this expansion. So if we just mentally prepare ourselves and put in 2 there, that's what's going on. How many of you have done algebraic number theory and seen the p-addicts? This does make sense two addically. And so if you've seen p-addicts and you know, the higher power of 2 you have, the smaller the number is. And if you were to multiply this through by 1 minus 2, you would basically get a telescoping series and it would end up being, um, or maybe I got to multiply by, Okay, so this is supposed to be negative 1. So, that's where, so what, what I want to do if I want to do this too adequately. So if I multiply, I'm sorry? Negative 1 plus 2. Okay, so, oh, no, no, if we, if we add 1 to this, we get 0. Because if we add 1 to this, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 8 is 16. So if we add 1 to this, you just basically march the powers of 2 all the way down, and you essentially get 2 to the infinity. And so this number is looking like the additive inverse in the two addicts of negative 1. Okay. To continue to blow your mind, let's look at other functions you've seen before from a different perspective for analytic continuation. And no, this is not because I'm excited. N factorial, what is this? Somebody please define N factorial for me. Okay. Like this? No. Okay. Natural numbers. Natural number. Oh, okay. Is zero a natural number? No. I, th I think it depends who you talk to as to whether or not zero is a natural number, but we won't go down to there. We'll define zero factorial to be one and n to be a non negative integer. This number has a combinatorial interpretation. What's the combinatorial interpretation for n factorial? Okay. So this is the number of ways to permute n elements. Or another way of looking at it is number of ways to choose n distinct people from n order matters. So the typical examples you often get uh, in student government, the difference between officers and representatives. In representatives, all representatives are equal. In officers, the president is usually different than the vice president. Does anybody remember Bush Sr.'s comment or quote about the job of the vice president? You die, I fly. You know, the job of the vice president is to travel to funerals 
and express our condolences and to say things like, you know, I'm my own man or my own woman, but in this particular case, I happen to support the president. So this is n factorial. Related to this are the binomial coefficients. So n choose k, we define as n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. It's the number of ways of choosing k objects from n when order matters. And one way to see this is if I look at n factorial divided by n minus k factorial, I get n, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to n minus k plus 1. That's the number of ways to choose k objects from n when order matters. If I want to then remove the ordering, I have to divide by k factorial. So you've probably seen these in Pascal's triangle. Can somebody tell me what 5 choose 3 is? How many ways can I choose 3 people from 5? 10. So my son is, he has to learn his multiplication tables quickly. So we were doing you know, speed games for you know, multiplying. So maybe we should do speed games for binomials. Uh, Four choose two. Four choose five. Zero, right? How many ways are there to choose five people from four? Do we all agree that this should be zero? Well, let's actually go back to the definition. Ah, so the swing, we've lost the swing. So four choose five would be four factorial over... 5 factorial, negative 1 factorial. This suggests something. What does this suggest? I'm sorry? Yeah, maybe extend factorial. And what should negative 1 factorial be? What does this suggest negative 1 factorial should be? Any other, anything else work? Yeah, so we have to decide if, you know, if we want to care about this. <laughs> uh, you know, if we have complex numbers, maybe it could be. So we will put an absolute value around that just to be safe and say, we will say that the absolute value of negative one factorial should be infinity. Okay. All right, so it swivels this way, but doesn't like to swivel that way. Interesting. Right. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about the gamma function. How many of you have seen the gamma function and the extension of, how many of you have not seen the gamma function? Okay, so, so this is one of the problems when you, you know, start teaching classes where people have entered through various pipelines. Is, you know, some of you will have seen things that others you have not. I will try to keep it as interesting as possible. Gamma of s is defined to be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x, x to the s minus 1 dx. Or if you do not like this definition, you may also define it as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x, x to the s dx over x. Either definition is acceptable. Why would we write it two different ways? When you look at this definition, what seems annoying? The minus one, you know, this is from the same people who gave you cosecant is related to sine. Why would we put a minus one here? The question is, which thing transforms nicely? Which things has the nice properties? What we really want is not the normal Lebesgue measure dx, but a multiplicative measure dx over x. If I multiply x by five, dx over x is invariant. It doesn't change. So this is the reason why we like to write it this way. It's really a kind of Mellon transform of a quantity like this. I believe it's the Mellon, all these different transforms are related, and I keep mixing up which one is which, but it's a nice transformation of the exponential function. So what's the easiest value to calculate for s? If you could choose any value of s. Which, zero or one? Because we have the annoying minus one, if we choose one, we get the integral of e to the minus x, well, the integral of the exponential is the exponential, and we get 1 when we do all the algebra. Of course, whenever you look at something like this, you should ask, you know, does this converge? 
you know, for what values of s does this make sense? There's two issues. The growth rate, or better yet, the decay rate, and then does it blow up anywhere? So as x goes to infinity, it doesn't matter what s is. This is polynomial growth. This is exponential death. There's no issue as x goes to infinity. So it's OK as x goes to infinity. Now, as x goes to 0, what can you say about e to the minus x? What does that look like? So what would e to the minus x look like as x goes to 0? It approaches 1. So as x goes to 1, looks like x to the yes minus 1. And so we see that it's actually potentially blowing up at the origin if s is uh, less than 1. So if s is greater than 1 in absolute value, no problem. Well, s could even be a little bit negative and we'd be OK. If s is 1 half, we would have x to the negative 1 half. When you integrate that, you would be getting on the order of x to the 1 half. That would be fine. So we're OK if the real part of s is greater than 1. I'm sorry, greater than 0. Because as long as the real part of s is greater than 0, this exponent is greater than negative 1. So when you integrate, you'll be fine. If the real part of s is 0, you've got 1 over x that integrates to a natural log of x that's going to blow up as x goes to 0. So the integral will be defined in those cases. If we want to do gamma of 2, we'll have e to the minus x, x to the first. So we get 0 to infinity, e to the minus x, x dx. What technique should we use to do this? Integration by parts. And when you finish, you get 1. So you know, natural conjecture is that no matter what positive integer you put in, you get back 1. <laughs> this conjecture dies very quickly when you look at gamma of 3, and you get 2. Then you realize, ah, it's not that it's always 1. It's, it's the Fibonacci numbers. That conjecture also dies very quickly as gamma of 4 is 6. All right, what conjecture is now looking good? Yeah, so this looks like 4 minus 1 factorial, 3 minus 1 factorial, 2 minus 1 factorial, 1 minus 1 factorial. What's so nice about this is this is giving us an idea of maybe this function is related to the factorial function. And so let's look at gamma of s plus 1, which is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the negative x, x to the s plus 1 minus 1 dx. So this is a chance to do you know, integration by parts, or yes. So we'll have u and dv. And so when you're trying to figure out which way do you want to do things, whenever you have an e to the minus, this is screaming at you, put this in the dv. Whenever you have a polynomial, it's screaming, put it in the u. Because when you take the derivative, you'll decrease the degree of that. The exponential is no problem. If we had an e to the minus x squared, we'd want to keep one of the x's with the e to the minus x squared so that we could integrate it. All right, so we get dv is e to the minus x dx. v is negative e to the minus x. u is x to the s. du is s, x to the s minus 1 dx. So gamma of s plus 1 is uv at 0 infinity minus the integral from 0 to infinity of v du. All right, well, when we do that, we have exponential death. Everything is going to be fine. This will vanish so long as s has real part greater than 0. So we get that this is equal to the minus and the minus becomes a plus integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus x we can pull the s outside the integral, x to the s minus 1 dx. Oh, and that's our old friend, gamma of s. And so I'll write up here. We get the functional equation, gamma of s plus 1 is s gamma of s.
This is really worth looking at and trying to understand what's going on. What it tells us is if we understand the gamma function in a certain regime, we can transfer that knowledge to other regimes. So if you look initially, the gamma function is well defined so long as the real part of s is greater than zero. So what we can do now is, let's say we want to understand what's going on at negative a half. If we know what's going on at one half, we can then transfer that to what's going on at negative a half. And we can just march down. So when we look at what's going on, you know, the real part of s greater than zero, we can just keep pushing this down. So the question becomes, is there any place where this gamma function blows up? I'm sorry? Well, we, we believe that negative 1 should cause problems. Can we use that? So here's the thing. We've got to be careful. Can we use this definition with s equals negative 1? No. Even though we'll get you know, infinity, which is the right answer, where is this formula valid? I have deliberately saved this on the board, even though board space is precious in this room, because we have to remember where are things defined. We cannot use this definition at s equals negative 1. So if we want to understand what's going on at s equals negative 1, we've got to understand what's going on at maybe s equals 0. Well, let's say we want to try to understand what's going on at s equals 0. We just need to know what's going on 1 above it at s equals 1. So if I put in s equals 1 over here, we get gamma of 1 is 0 times gamma of 0. OK, this could be interesting. So taking s equals 0, we get gamma of 1, which is 1, is equal to 0 times gamma of 0. What can we conclude? There's only one way a relationship like this can hold. What can we conclude? Gamma zero is undefined, or there's a pole there. There's a pole there. You know, something is happening. You know, pole rank happens at s equals zero in the gamma function. We've got to be very careful when we have something like this. We can take the limit as s goes to zero. I'm, I'm, yes. And if we look at the original definition, if we take the limit as s goes to zero, we will get plus infinity. So if we look at the limit as s goes to zero from above of gamma of s, that will be infinity. So the gamma function has a pole at s equals zero. Now, an interesting question is, what if you take any point other than s equals 0? What if you take, say, s equals i times pi, or square root of 2 times i? So what about gamma of i square roots of 2, which is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x, x to the i root 2 minus 1. So I'll write it as dx over x. What do you think is going to happen now? The real part is 0, which is still bad. But the imaginary part now oscillates enormously. And so what if we would take the limit as we go from epsilon to infinity and let epsilon go to 0? So look at the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the integral from epsilon to infinity of e to the minus x, x to the i root 2 dx over x. Is there enough oscillation to make this work? Do we have to go all the way up to infinity if we're trying to understand this? Everything's well behaved except near zero. If you want, just integrate up to one and just try to look and see what's going on here. 
is this finite, is this well behaved? So I'll leave this as an exercise for you to try to see if you can do this calculation. Okay. So the gamma function has some amazing properties. Now that we know that gamma of zero is a pole, it just propagates. Gamma of negative one, so now I take s equals negative one, gamma of negative one, so we get gamma of zero is negative one times gamma of negative one. Gamma of negative one is also infinity. In fact, you get gamma is equal to infinity at all the negative integers. So we get gamma of negative m equals infinity if m is a inter, uh, positive integer or zero. Yes? You get this first relation from the integration by parts. Yes. So why are we happy that this relationship still holds past s equals zero? Because if we were kind of following our u d u stuff with s equals zero. So it's a good question. It's the same thing as the geometric series. We're continuing. This is our definition of the gamma function. Okay. It is the function that satisfies these properties. When the real part of s is greater than zero, it has this as a representation. But this representation is no longer the defining. We just kind of generalized and now we're dealing with Correct. Now, there was a lot of people over the years who were very concerned with minimal definitions. So for instance, what functions satisfy gamma of s plus one equals s gamma of s? The gamma function is one. Can anybody think of another function that satisfies this? Yes. I'm sorry? Multiples of it. Multiples of it. Constant zero function. Is there anything else? So how fundamental is this relationship? What kind of functions can you have that satisfy this relationship? Clearly, we want to at least eliminate multiples. So we would like to normalize our function by specifying a value at one point. And I believe, I should double check this. I think it was Niels Bohr's brother, who was actually one of the people who you know, proved that there are three properties that uniquely determine the gamma function. And you want some kind of you know, concavity about its growth. And then when you put that in, I'll put this in the additional comments, a value at one special point and this functional relationship, there's only one function that satisfies these properties. And this is really nice because if you can prove that you know, a quantity that you're studying has a certain form, you would then like to be able to determine what it is. The strongest example we have of this is, you know, for instance, like Liouville's theorem. We have an entire function that's bounded. We understand bounded entire functions extremely well. And so how much freedom do we have with a relationship like this? If we don't demand a solomorphic, can't we define anything in the strip in a given unit interval? It won't necessarily be holomorphic, but we could. Well, we could start off with a holomorphic function <laughs> in a strip. Yeah. But then the question is, will it have the correct boundary relationship? So if we had some kind of like maybe periodicity on the ends, or so you know, it's an interesting exercise. If you want for extra credit, what functions can you write down that would satisfy something like this? How restrictive is this? So the gamma function is going to be extremely important in both probability, when we do the central limit theorem, and in analytic number theory. So the whole point is we start with something useful and extend it to another regime. And it does give us that these binomial coefficients will be zero. It's nice when math is consistent like this. Um, I will write down one more identity, but I'm not going to bother proving it. This is the secant formula. Or is it the cosecant formula? It's the cosecant formula. So I believe it's gamma of s, gamma of 1 minus s equals pi over sine of pi s. How many of you have seen this formula before? I think I did this in probability. But I've taught probability so many times and it's slightly different each year. I can't remember if it was in the year the two of you took it. 
So when you see this formula, if you listen, it's screaming at your specific value of s to use. What value of s? One half. Because if you take s equals one half, these two are the same. So when you take s equals one half, this gives you gamma of one half squared is pi over sine of pi halves, which is pi. We know gamma of one half is positive. As gamma of one half is greater than zero, this implies gamma of one half is the square root of pi. For those of you who would like a combinatorial interpretation of this, gamma of one half is one half minus one factorial, which is negative one half factorial, which is square root of pi. So if you are ever in a situation where you have negative one half of people to order, and order matters for how you place these negative half of a person, there is square root of pi ways to do this. Interestingly, there's more ways to do this than to order zero people. So for people who haven't taken probability with me, where does square root of pi come into play? The integral of the Gaussian. So you may have seen uh, the proof of the normalization constant for the Gaussian by this beautiful polar trick where you square the integral and you change coordinates. You can do that just using the gamma function. If people are interested, I can send you proofs of the cosecant identity from my probability book. There's lots of different ways of proving this elementarily using the definition of the gamma function. All right, so let me just quickly show you why this is so important and related to probability. So we get, um, we want to integrate from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. This is close to the definition of the standard normal. So the standard normal, oh sorry, minus infinity to infinity. The standard normal has a 1 over square root of 2 pi so that it integrates to 1. In probability, we have a random variable is non-negative and it integrates to 1. So as long as your integral is finite and your function is non-negative, you can always renormalize it. Typically, you might look at more than just the standard normal. You might look at an arbitrary normal where you have a mean mu variance sigma squared. The general case for the density is 1 over 2 pi sigma squared square root e to the negative x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. But if I want to figure out the normalization constant of this, I can just do a slew of change of variables. You know, let t equal x minus mu over sigma. And when you do that, you'll basically transform understanding this integral to understanding this integral. In upper level math, they would never write t equals, they would do the really annoying x equals x minus mu over sigma to maximize confusion. I don't like using the same letter for the new variable as the old variable. I once took a math class where f meant one thing on the left side of the equation and another thing on the right side of the equation. <laughs> they were different f's but written the same way. It was one of the worst math classes I ever took. So let's say we want to evaluate this. This looks like a gamma function, but the exponent is a little bit off. We have an e to the x squared of negative x squared over 2. We want an e to the negative x. So this suggests a change of variable. What change of variable should we do? u equals, I'm sorry, x squared over 2. So then we would get du, oh, the 2 is canceled, right? Life is good, is x dx. Well, we unfortunately don't have an x dx. We just have a dx. So we get dx is x to the minus 1 du. Well, I can solve for x in terms of u. If u equals x squared over 2, then I get 2u to the 1 half equals x. So we would get dx is equal to 2u to the minus 1 half du. So if we call this integral i, we get i is the integral, now we're going to be a little, okay. Uh, when u equals minus infinity, I'm sorry, when x equals minus infinity, what does u equal?
infinity. And when u equals plus infinity, what does u equal? Yeah. OK, good. So I don't even have to write anything more. You've hopefully realized that at some point, this is not good. I should not be integrating from infinity to infinity. Where did I go wrong? What's the mistake? We get to go back to math 150, 151, calc 3, change of variable formula. Can somebody else please smile? Anybody remember that? Or are you still talking to your therapists about these <laughs> things? No? You have to make sure when you do a change of variable that you have a one-to-one -one transformation. So the mapping u equals x squared over 2. This is not one-to-one -one from minus infinity to infinity. It is from 0 to infinity. So rather than integrating from minus infinity to infinity, what should we do up here? Cut it in half. Cut it in half. Can you just cut it in half? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Works for me. And then we'll multiply by 2. And now if we do that, now everything is fine. And now we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity. e to the negative x squared over 2 becomes e to the negative u. And now we have a 2u to the minus 1 half du. All right, let's do some algebra. 2 to the minus 1 half and a 2 becomes a 2 to the 1 half. We have an integral from 0 to infinity. We have an e to the minus u. We have a u to the minus 1 half. But if I want to write this as a gamma function, how should I write u to the minus 1 half? u to the, OK, or minus 1. It's less chalk to write minus 1. So if I write it like this now, what does this become? Gamma 1 half. So we get the normalization constant is the square root of 2, gamma of 1 half. And from what we calculated before, that's going to be the square root of 2 pi. So here's yet another place where the gamma function comes into play. The normalization constant for the normal, and if you want to calculate the moments, which we'll do later, if you put in an x to the k over here, trivial to deal with the next to the k. Because the next to the k will just be a 2u to the k halves. And that just changes where you evaluate the gamma function. So we can get all of these formulas. Um, if you want, I will send you an email for Wallace's formula for pi. There's a way to write pi as an infinite product and you actually can get it essentially from gamma of 1 half. And so I'll send that to you as just another application of basic probability. This is what happens when you let a number theorist teach a probability class. And so I did this when I was a postdoc at Brown, is I used the t distribution to prove Wallace's formula. This is not really what the statisticians want you to be doing with the t distribution. And this is one of the reasons why I am typically not allowed to teach real statistics classes at Williams. All right. So the gamma function is going to be extremely important in our investigations. It's going to be one of the key building blocks in completing and analytically continuing the Riemann zeta function. So it's probably time to write the Riemann zeta function. Question? Um, I guess I'm still confused by this whole extension stuff okay. that we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. Yep. So we couldn't say that like that integral over there, if we plugged in an s with real part less than 0, we can't say that's gamma of negative something. Correct. Negative Correct. And in fact, when you prove the cosecant identity, which I unfortunately just erased, you've got to be extremely careful because you have gamma of s, gamma of 1 minus s. You can represent both of them as integrals and expand out the integrals. But if you're doing that, you need both s and 1 minus s to have real part greater than 0. Well, that means s is then going to be very restricted. And so what you do is you prove the cosecant formula for s that's restricted. And then you use the continuation of the gamma function to show it holds everywhere. And so I will send you the notes from my probability book. It's, it's really beautiful how you can prove the cosecant formula and do these integrations. It's also a really good warning about how easy it is to use something in a place where you are not allowed to. Now, I know some of you are majoring in physics. I don't know if anybody here is in econ still. And so you know, if you do stuff like that, you don't have to worry as much about, is this justified? But in here, we have to be very careful. And we want to make sure that these arguments are valid. Yes? Yes. Can we evaluate like gamma of a third exactly or like gamma of a rational number? So it's a very difficult question to evaluate gamma at specific things. 
at things like one third, there are formulas for stuff like that. And you know, it comes down to, I think, gamma, you know, m over n, where m and n are rationals, we have ways to handle stuff like that. Now, if you want to try to do gamma of a third, uh, one thing you could do is you could do gamma of a third, gamma of two thirds, and get the thing for sine. Right, and then the question is, what do you do with gamma of two thirds? Is there a formula that relates maybe gamma of two s and gamma of s? You know, are there things you can do along those lines? And so, for the rest of the semester, we're doing advanced topics. We've already done essentially the core of a complex analysis course. If there are things that you find more interesting than the homework problems I'm assigning that you would rather look at, by all means, let me know. If you'd rather replace some of the upcoming homework problems with how do I evaluate gamma of a third, how do I evaluate gamma of m over n, I'm absolutely happy to change the homework assignments and personalize the course a little bit. You know, this is essentially a graduate course. What are you interested in? What excites you? You know, there's going to be minimal amounts from this point onward that will be on the final. You know, there will be one question on, we've covered the following special topics. Talk about one of them. Uh, there might be some specific things um, that will let you know. Maybe if we do stationary phase, that might be fair game because this is an extremely powerful technique. But a lot of these are advanced topics. And you know, however far you want to pursue them, happy to adjust with you. I want you to see what's out there and to see what kind of techniques we need. So how many of you have seen the Riemann zeta function? Okay. So we define it as zeta of s is the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, of 1 over n to the s. And as long as the real part of s is greater than 0, this will converge. It turns out this is equal to the product over all primes, p prime, of 1 minus 1 over p to the s inverse. And this is called the Euler product. What do you think of when you see this expression over here? Geometric series, right? We don't know much. Whenever possible, we want to convert things to one of the few things we know. Geometric series. So if you write this, this is 1 over 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 5 to the s, dot, 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 dot. When you expand everything out, uh, let me see, am I doing this correctly? Yes. When you expand this out, you get 1 plus 1 over 2 to the s, plus 1 over 2 to the 2s, plus 1 over 2 to the 3s, plus dot, 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 times similar things for all the others. And when you multiply everything out by unique factorization, every integer can be written uniquely as a product of prime powers, you'll get the numbers 1 over n to the s. And each number you'll get once and only once. It's a good exercise for you to go through and do this argument carefully and rigorously. The way you would like to do it is maybe you take all the products of p up to some big prime big p and then show that that will agree with the first so many terms in here and the difference will be negligible and then if you take the limit you'll be fine. You also want to make sure the real part of s is greater than 0, I'm sorry, greater than 1 so that this converges. Oh, I'm sorry, I want 1 here, not 0. Okay, so this is the Riemann zeta function. One of the reasons it is so useful is that the integers are not that mysterious. If you are looking at what should I study in grad school, the distribution of the positive integers has already been completely mined. There are no mysteries. You know, the next integer after 2015. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry? Open question. Open question. Although there was, the, there was some press release from some European agency where I think they have got like around 2016.1 with some uncertainty. <laughs> this was from CERN. <laughs> the, there's no uncertainty in the measurements of integers. We know the next integer. What's the next prime after 2015? Maybe. It's at least possible. It's not a multiple of 3, it's not a multiple of 5, yeah. not a multiple of 7, so uh, not a multiple of 11. So looking, looking good. But it's much harder to figure out where the primes are. So the idea is if we understand the integers, we hope to be able to pass from knowledge of the integers to knowledge over the primes. So what's a value of s where we understand this sum? 
two. Okay. There's usually a value they say before two. One. So when you take s equals one, you get the harmonic series. And so s equals one, zeta of one is plus infinity. There must be infinitely many primes. We can do a little bit better. Uh, this is not quite as good of a, as a physics hat, but it's at least a high school hat, so I don't have to worry about the advanced uh, mathematics and being rigorous. Let's just say the sum of n less than or equal to x of 1 over n is equal to approximately the product of primes less than or equal to x of 1 minus 1 over p inverse. Ballpark reasonable. You know, we'll, we'll worry about error terms later, but just to get some rough idea of what's going on. You know, they'll at least agree with all numbers up to uh, 1 over n, but then this will have a couple of other terms. But the terms will be somewhat deep down, so we can worry about exactly how good it is. We know what this growth rate is. Approximately how big is this? It's about log x. What should we do to both sides? I'm sorry? Nope. Opposite. Log. log. Why should we take a log? Turn a to turn a product to some. Whenever you see a product for the rest of your life, I want you to always think about taking a logarithm. Even if it turns out to be a bad idea, at least have that thought. Okay. If you see a product, take a log. So this is about the log of x. So if we take logs, we get the log of the log of x is approximately negative sum of p less than equal to x the log of 1 minus 1 over p. What's the log of 1 minus u? The log of 1 minus u is approximately minus u. Just the first term Taylor series. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do have a physics degree. And you get log log x is approximately, the minuses cancel, and you get the sum p less than or equal to x of 1 over p. That formula is actually correct. Physicists are basically careless mathematicians who are always right. <laughs> if you're not right, you no longer stay in physics, you move down the ladder. The physicists are real, oh, this is being recorded. The <laughs> physicists are really good about knowing when you can play a little bit fast and loose with the mathematics. This is phenomenal that with this quick argument, not only do you get that there are infinitely many primes, you get some idea of how rapidly the primes are growing. They're growing so rapidly the number of them, there's so many of them, that the sum of the reciprocals blows up. Can you give me another infinite sequence where the sum of the reciprocals is finite? Powers of two. Powers of two. I want something else, though. Squares. Squares. Because now we can go back to zeta of two. And so now if we take s equals two, zeta of two is the sum, that's too close, is the sum n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, it's pi squared over 6. And this will be the product over primes of 1 minus 1 over p squared inverse. If there were only finitely many primes, what could you tell me about this number? Rational. rational. Because this number is irrational, there must be infinitely many primes. I believe I've already mentioned this course that I've been working with two students here to actually extract growth rates as to how many primes there must be up to x given that pi squared is irrational. The original proof that I had years ago was very bad because I was using a big result from Rin and Viola which assumes the prime number theorem. So by assuming the prime number theorem, I'm able to get a weaker result than the prime number theorem. This is not really publishable. So what you can then do is you go into Rin and Viola's paper where they look at the irrationality exponent of pi squared over 6. And you see, where do they use the prime number theorem? They use it to estimate the least common multiple of the numbers from 1 to x. And so then if you replace the prime number theorem with weaker results based on what we're doing, you can actually get some interesting results as to how rapidly this rate grows. But this gives you two special values of the Riemann zeta function. Now, I have hopefully timed this perfectly good because I did not look up the rest of the stuff. What is the question you would like to ask about the Riemann zeta function right now? This is the one we want to end on. How do you extend it? Tune in Wednesday. Okay?